So, um, good afternoon one more time. Uh, my name is uh, Luba Jankovic from uh, the University of Hertfordshire from the uh, Centre for Future Societies Research. And um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, meeting in which um, uh, Thomas Grieco uh, will be presenting us uh, um, his talk about transcend transcending the present political money system the urgent need and the way to do it. Um, Thomas Grieco is uh, a, a preeminent scholar, author, educator, and community economist. He's widely regarded as a leading authority on moneyless exchange systems, community currencies, and uh, financial innovation, and is uh, a sought out, uh, out speaker sought after speaker uh, internationally. He has conducted uh, workshops and lectured in 15 countries on five continents, has been an advisor to currency and reciprocal exchange projects around the world. He has authored numerous articles and books, including The End of Money and the Future of Civilization. And um, I would just like to show uh, Thomas's book to you, which I came across uh, and, and read uh, um, a while ago. Uh, and usually when I find some good ideas in the book, I put a bookmark, except for this book, I, I, I have run out of bookmarks, um, as you can, you can just about see. So there are so many good ideas in this book. And uh, with that, I'll uh, pass you over to Thomas to, uh, to deliver his talk. Thomas. Thank you, Professor Yankovic. Uh, I really appreciate your putting this uh, event together and giving me an opportunity to share what I've learned over the last 45 years about the problems that are inherent in our money system and giving me an opportunity to uh, also outline some of the solutions that I've discovered and developed along the way. Uh, and welcome everyone, uh, happy to have you here and uh, hoping that we'll have a lively discussion after my presentation. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the book that Professor Yankovic uh, showed you is the UK edition of The End of Money and the Future of Civilization. It's, uh, it's different from the uh, US and other uh, countries edition, which uh, has a different cover but it's basically the same content. Um, I'd like to start with a slideshow that I've prepared for this event. And uh, I'll share my screen so you can see that. Okay, is that visible to everyone, I hope? Yes, yes it is. Okay, I've titled this slideshow, A World Without Money, Interest, and Debt. Now, this kind of world might seem preposterous to anyone who's been conventionally trained in economics, money and banking or related fields. But, you know, what I'm talking about is uh, the new world without money, interest, and debt will still have exchange media to, to perform the money function. It will still have rewards for taking risk, which will replace interest. And it will still have obligations of one sort or another that will replace debt. And I see this as a pathway toward economic equity, social justice, freedom, and peace. And this is the kind of world that I think uh, we would all like to live in. So, what started me out on this quest 45 years ago was uh, uh, trying to understand why we have these recurrent economic depressions, uh, inflation, debt crises that keep recurring, why we're always in conflict and war with somebody, why we have hunger and squalor in the midst of plenty. And it occurs to me to ask the question as well, what kind of future are we facing? You know, we've been on a path for a long time, which seems to be leading us toward an abyss. 
What are the emerging challenges and opportunities that we're facing as businesses, communities, and governments? So I concluded a long time ago that we are on the brink of a global collapse of one sort or another. You know, we have uh, environmental changes that are taking place with droughts and floods and extreme weather events all over the world. We have polluted air, land, water. Uh, it's becoming more difficult now to find drinkable sources of fresh water. Uh, even here where I live in Tucson, you know, we have many of our uh, wells that provide much of our water are polluted with uh, uh, toxic chemicals that are known carcinogens. We're facing the end of cheap oil and gas. You know, we're not going to run out of oil and gas, but we're, we're experiencing a situation where it's costing ever more in terms of energy input to get the energy out. So all of these resources are being depleted and we're seeing financial disruptions uh, of different kinds, bankruptcies, unemployments, uh, financial crises like the one we faced in 2008. And basically all of our institutions are breaking down. And I sort of liken this to the uh, metamorphic change be between the caterpillar and the butterfly. And I'll say more of that as we go along. So what has characterized our modern civilization has been exploitation and domination. You know, the colonial era seems to have passed with the uh, independence of different countries in Africa and Asia and other places around the world, but colonialism still exists. It's economic colonialism rather than political colonialism. Then we have a history of uh, people being dispossessed of their uh, wealth, their land, and uh, their resources. Uh, we had overt slavery for a long period of time. Now that has given way to more subtle forms of slavery, wage slavery, debt slavery, uh, predatory commerce, monopoly and oligopoly. And we're seeing governments uh, collude amongst themselves with uh, corporations. So what is driving this destructive engine? Uh, I concluded quite some time ago that the engine of destruction is actually the growth imperative that is built in to the debt money system. As I will explain presently, uh, money is created on the basis of interest bearing debt. And this causes debt to increase exponentially. And in the process of trying to avoid default, uh, companies and individuals need to find a way to get money out of the economy. So a lot of my colleagues have argued that the, uh, the driver of uh, this destructive path that we're on is the ready availability of fossil fuel energy. I contend that that's the enabler, but not the driver. The driver is the debt money system. And of course, the break is nature. Nature is telling us that you cannot have exponential growth forever. So we need to look at the question of what is money and how is it created? Now we all learn in Economics 101 that money is a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a measure of value. But this is not correct. This tells us at best what money does, not what money is. And uh, these are different functions that need to be performed by different things. Now it's true when money was in the form of, let's say a gold coin or a silver coin, it could perform all three of those functions. It could be a medium of exchange, it could be a store of value and it could measure value. But no commodity has ever been sufficient in providing for the exchange function. So a commodity can be a store of value or a measure of value, but it cannot be a flexible medium of exchange. It cannot expand in quantity uh, in step with expansion in economic output. 
One of the uh, noted economists of the 20th century, Professor John Kenneth Galbraith said, the process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. And I've found that to be true every time I give a lecture, uh, people's eyes glaze over when I tell them about it and uh, they just can't seem to believe what I'm telling them. But here it is direct from the Bank of England, a working paper that was published a few years ago, 2015. <clears throat> it says in the real world, banks provide financing through money creation. That is, they create deposits of new money through lending. And in doing so are mainly constrained by profitability, solvency and considerations. So what is that saying? Uh, in short, banks create money by making loans. Uh, these loans are the deposits to borrowers accounts. And the constraints on that have nothing to do with so-called reserves or other things, it's basically uh, profitability and solvency considerations. Now, I've known this for a long time. I discovered it through a publication from the Federal Reserve, which was published in 1966, and I discovered it in the mid 1970s. They said <clears throat> the actual process of money creation takes place primarily in banks checkable liabilities of banks are money. These liabilities are customers' accounts. They increase when the proceeds of loans made by banks are credited to borrowers' accounts. Now, it'll be easier to understand that if I show you a picture. So here's a bank. And uh, as we said, banks create money as deposits or account balances when they grant a loan. So let's say you go to a bank and you say, I wanna borrow some money, uh, I want a mortgage so that I can buy a house. Well, the bank makes two entries on their books. You sign a mortgage note, which becomes an asset to the bank. And in turn, the bank makes a deposit to your account. This is the creation of debt money which is a liability on the bank's ledger. So with this simple act, the bank has created money. Did your mind repel? Well, there's a problem with this. Banks do not do all of this for free. When they grant a loan or so-called loan, they want you to pay interest and interest accrues over time. You borrow, let's say, $100 today that needs to be repaid in one year's time. If the interest rate is 10%, then at the end of one year, you will owe the bank $110 or 110 pounds for euros or whatever the going uh, currency is in your jurisdiction. But the bank did not create sufficient money for the interest to be paid. So where are you going to get the money to pay the interest as well as the principal? <clears throat> the only way you can do that is by competing in the market with others to try to get sufficient money that was created when someone else took a loan from a bank. So this is essential to be understood that the banks create money by making loans, but they don't create enough money to pay the interest on those loans. Uh, excuse me for just a moment. Here are some quotes that describe the extent of the money power. And money is so important because it is a powerful tool. 
the patriarch of the Rothschild dynasty said, give me the power to create a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. Reginald McKenna, who was president of the Midland Bank in England said, those who create and issue money and credit direct the policies of government and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. E.C. Regal said, the debt economy rests upon a conspiracy between the political state and the banking interests against commercial exchange. Now, you don't have to be a believer in conspiracy theories to understand that it is in the narrow materialistic self-interest of the people who control money to uh, try to consolidate ever more power and wealth in their own hands. So the modern banking system actually, well, it began before the Bank of England, but the Bank of England provided the prototype for the central bank. So now we have central banks uh, in every country throughout the world. The Bank of England was chartered in 1694 when William III came to power. He was fighting a war against France and he needed money to finance the war. And of course, it's always, uh, there's always a limit to how much you can tax your subjects um, directly. So the William Patterson and his associates who founded the Bank of England came to the king and they said, we will give you all the money you need to fight your war if you will give us the power to issue banknotes and lend them into circulation. So that gave the Bank of England a virtual monopoly on credit. So the bank financed the King's War. The Bank of England became the model for central banks around the world, including the first and second banks of the United States. And uh, that's a, an interesting story in itself, which I write about in my book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization. So this collusion between the financial power and the political power has continued a relentless drive towards fascist tyranny. And we've, bought, we've been on this train for now uh, more than 300 years. And we are now reaching the point where we will have a global fascist government. Uh, one of the people who warned against this was Franklin Roosevelt. He was president from 1933 until 1944 when he died. He said the first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That in essence is fascism, ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. Now, the central banks are not part of the government. In some places, they, be, they may be nominally part of the government. Uh, in others, they are not. The Federal Reserve Banks, for example, are not part of the US government. They are separate and independent and owned by banking corporations. Now, this is a very important quote from Professor Carol Quigley. He was a Georgetown historian, taught in the Foreign Service School for many years, trained many diplomats, uh, many US diplomats uh, who went into the Foreign Service in the State Department. He was a former mentor of President Bill Clinton. Clinton praised him in his acceptance speech when he was nominated for president in 1992, Quigley wrote a book called Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. Uh, it's been said that if you don't understand history, you are bound to repeat it. And Quigley was an insider. He knew the ins and outs of the power structure. And he said this, and it's very important to pay attention to it. He said the powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control 
in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. And that's, that's not the half of it. Uh, we've seen now how central banks, by controlling interest rates, they can control the entire economy. By controlling the money supply, they control the entire economy. And uh, I'll get to another mechanism by which they control the economy and the politics of each country. So we're told that the purpose of the central banks is to keep uh, inflation low and to try to promote full employment. Well, that's, uh, that's window dressing. That is not the truth. The true purpose of central banks is to enable the monopolization of credit and the practice of usury by the banking cartel. To enable profligate deficit spending by national governments and to enrich and empower a super class. And that's becoming ever more apparent as time goes on. So we have a flawed system that is being kept alive by this collusive arrangement between finance and politics. But we need to ask, why are all the governments in debt? Why, why is this a phenomenon? Is there any natural reason for governments to be in debt? Why can't they balance their budgets? Why are budget deficits chronic? Why do these debts continue to grow ever faster and are now reaching astronomical proportions? Well, the answer is, and I haven't heard this from any other academic or economist, but under the interest-based debt money system, central governments must assume the role of borrower of last resort. You know, we hear about central banks being the lender of last resort, but there also is a borrower of last resort, and that's the government. And that's necessary to keep the money supply pumped up and prevent economic depressions. Now, John Maynard Keynes, you may recall, uh, proposed that during the Great Depression, governments needed to step in and uh, create money in order to get out of the depression. Now his theory was that by pumping up the money supply, uh, we could get the economy working again. And uh, once the economy was recovered, then the governments could run a surplus in order to repay the deficit that was run uh, during the difficult times. But of course, as we've seen, uh, that time never comes for, for repayment of the uh, deficits that the government ran during the depression. Uh, Keynes didn't seem to realize that this was a one-way street, that because of the uh, interest that is built into the money creation process, there needs to be a continual expansion of debt to keep the money supply from contracting and prevent economic depression. Well, just look at this. This is a, a chart of the US government national debt over the period of time from 1900 up until the present, actually up until 2020. And you can see that the peak of this graph is about a little more than $23 trillion. But according to the US debt clock, the actual debt uh, as of last week was 28.7 
trillion dollars. And uh, we're seeing budget deficits, federal budget deficits now that are so extraordinary in relation to past history that it just boggles the mind. And nobody is batting an eye about it. Uh, the US Congress just passed a multi-trillion dollar uh, infrastructure uh, bill that is going to be financed through additional budget deficits. And it's the same way around the world. But looking at this in relation to gross domestic, domestic product, which is uh, supposed to be a measure of overall economic activity, we see that currently uh, the US government debt to GDP is uh, well above 125%. Uh, surpassing the deficit or the debt that was incurred during World War II to finance the war. Now that, that debt in relation to GDP uh, shrunk because of the increase in GDP as we had tremendous increases in productivity from 1945 on until, uh, you know, up until uh, the present actually. But because the debt is now growing faster than GDP, uh, and, and we're at the end of the rope as far as fixes are concerned, we're not going to see a similar uh, decline because of growth of GDP in the future. So it's not only the government sector that's uh, exponentially growing debt. Uh, this is a chart of private sector debt from about the mid 1950s. Uh, up until 2016, this is the latest uh, data that I could find. Here's GDP, this is, uh, excuse me, that's not GDP, this is national income, uh, tax revenues and such. So we can see in relation to that, it's quite small compared to the private sector debt. And this is true of all countries around the world. Now with the 2008 financial meltdown, the whole system was on the brink of collapse. So there was an extraordinary move that was taken by the central banks around the world in order to prevent this collapse. And it was basically adding to the previously modest amounts of direct purchases of securities by central banks to astronomical amounts of stocks and bonds that central banks have now added to their portfolio. Now, this is massive manipulation of the securities markets, and it's happening all around the world. This chart just shows a few of the major central banks, um, including the uh, European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, Federal Reserve, Bank of England, and the Swiss National Bank. And this is the ECB, you can see what they've done uh, since 2008 from virtually nothing on their balance sheet to enormous purchases of stocks and bonds. So to sum up, the political money regime is dysfunctional and exploitative. A large proportion of the money is improperly issued. You know, it goes to sweetheart deals. Uh, if you're a favored politician, maybe you get a loan on favorable terms that you might never have to repay, or it's coupled with some uh, sure thing investment that will allow you to pay it back easily and add to it. So there's massive corruption of the political system because of this money power. It doesn't go where it's most deserved or needed, which is the small and local enterprises that are the backbone of every community. It exploits productive enterprise through interest, bank fees, and foreclosures. You know, banks make uh, credit easy and interest rates low for a period of time. And then when everybody is uh, in debt, uh, they tighten up on loans and increase interest rates, forcing bankruptcies and foreclosures. So this money system is manipulated for the benefit of, of its controllers, creating a power elite and a wealthy superclass. And we've seen enormous increases 
in the number of billionaires and the amount of their wealth over the last several decades. <clears throat> so we have massive centralization of power and concentration of wealth, undermining of democratic government, inequity and class conflict. And as I said, we have this thing driving artificial growth through the debt imperative and the growth imperative as everybody scrambles to try to avoid defaulting on their debt. So interest bearing debt growing to impossible levels is the phenomenon we're experiencing now. We're seeing banks bailed out. You know, in 2008, uh, instead of bailing out the debtors, the governments and the central banks kept the banks alive by bailing them out, basically giving them uh, government, government bonds in return for their uncollectible uh, assets. We have structural adjustment programs and austerity for many. Uh, Greece is a good case in point. I've spent a lot of time in Greece and uh, Greece has been forced into austerity, which is damaging small to medium-sized businesses and individuals. It's damaging uh, people on pensions and forcing Greece to take on additional debt. Political corruption, as we mentioned, attacks on social programs, privatization of government-owned assets, which has been ongoing for a long time. When you think about the commons, we, we say that the commons is comprised of all of those things that weren't created. There are, there are common heritage. The earth was not created by anyone who now lives on it, you know. So the commons have been privatized increasingly and taken over to generate profits for a few. And we're seeing reduced national sovereignty through this politicization of money, which is leading to despotism. So the corporate power is taking over the power of government through these massive uh, banking institutions, which use as instruments the central banks, Bank for International Settlements, the IMF, and the World Bank. And this is leading us to the new feudal New World Order. What we need to be doing instead is moving power from national governments in a democratic way to the people and to communities through credit clearing networks and community currencies, which is what I'm going to present uh, subsequently. This is what I call the butterfly society. So where are we headed as a civilization? You know, we see movies like Mad Max where we have a post-apocalyptic situation of people greedily and selfishly fighting against one another to gain whatever remains of the resources. So we have violent conflict and waste and a new dark age is in prospect. Or will we choose societal metamorphosis to move away from the old caterpillar society to a new butterfly society where we choose to cooperate, be generous with one another and share what we have, be compassionate, be in solidarity with all humanity across racial, ethnic, national lines. A complete restructuring is what is called for. So looking at the emerging butterfly society, <clears throat> this is already underway. I think we've already entered the chrysalis stage of this metamorphic process. While the old caterpillar economics promotes continuous growth of economic output and quantitative measures of value and well being, you know, more is better, bigger is better, accumulate as much capital as you can, passive income, it's called. 
uh, we're consuming resources at an unsustainable rate. The emphasis has been on getting more and more product out of less and less labor, making it more difficult for those who subsist by selling their label, labor <clears throat> to continue to subsist, to generate income for themselves. Growing disparities of wealth and power, <clears throat> which is the consumer society. In contrast, the new butterfly economics, as I call it, promotes steady state economic output. As Gandhi said, there's enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. The emphasis now shifts from quantitative to qualitative measures of value and well being. How about more leisure, more peace, more time to play, more time to spend in doing things with people we enjoy? A time to restore the commons, that is, to create systems that will return us to a Garden of Eden rather than a despoiled planet. The emphasis will be on resource productivity, that is, getting more value out of each pound of minerals or each barrel of oil or other natural resource. More equitable distribution of wealth and power. <clears throat> this is what I call the convivial society, to borrow a term from Ivan Illich. Excuse me a moment. My voice doesn't hold out as well as it used to. So the things that we need to do to resolve our predicament <clears throat> include harmonizing the incentives with the desired outcomes. You know, right now <clears throat> we have corporations trying to maximize their profits by increasing their sales reducing their costs. So with the model that they're using now, <clears throat> this requires repeat business. They don't build products that are durable, repairable, recyclable. They build products that are intended to wear out. They build products that will be superseded by new products with minor improvements. So we need to harmonize the incentives with the desired outcome, which is to reduce waste, to eliminate the growth imperative. We need to end the creation of money based on interest-bearing debt. We need to separate money and state. I have a chapter in my book, The End of Money, that addresses that point. We need to tame the corporate beast. <clears throat> when I talk about the corporate beast, uh, corporations have actually become a beast, uh, an alien entity. You know, the, the aliens that we need to fear are not extraterrestrial. They're aliens that we've created right here on earth called corporations. The corporations are created by charter granted by a government. They are creatures of the government. And the corporate charter was granted in order to perform some socially useful function by aggregating capital uh, to do that. In the process, the owners or contributors of capital to a corporation 
we're given the privilege of limited liability. That means if you own a share of corporate stock, your liability is limited only to the assets that you put into the corporation, not to your personal assets. Well, the time was when corporations were very limited. Charter would uh, have a limited duration, let's say for 20 years. And the corporate charter would also say the corporation could only do this particular function. Well, <clears throat> those limitations have long since been eliminated through this collusion between politics and finance. So now corporations can do whatever they want. <clears throat> there is no limit on their lifetime. Um, they basically, as I said, have taken over the functions of government. And this globalization that has been the, uh, the process over the last several decades uh, needs to come to an end. We need to go from globalization to relocalization. We need to relocalize spending, saving, investing, production, and distribution. We need to be, rebuild this civilization from the bottom up, starting with existing communities. We need to decentralize the control of credit to the communities and restructure our institutions and systems on a foundation of better values and ideals. <clears throat> so the starting point is with the exchange function. Uh, I won't have time to talk about uh, the, the uh, savings and investment function or the measure of value function, but those are also covered in my book. So I envision a new global internet of exchange based on human solidarity, cooperation, and mutual aid. How do we transfer value? Uh, we can give someone a gift without any expectation of return. This is voluntary. We can be forced to give up value, either through theft, robbery, or extortion, or by taxes that the government insists that we pay. But the vast majority of value transfers are in the realm of reciprocal exchange. This is voluntary agreement where you expect to get as much as you give and give as much as you get. Uh, the ways of mediating exchange, reciprocal exchange, are through political fiat money or through the innovative exchange mechanisms that I'm going to talk about. So how do we manage reciprocal exchange? <clears throat> we can do it through direct barter. <clears throat> but this is a very limited mechanism. You have to have something I want. I have to have something you want. Otherwise we cannot have a direct barter. Another possibility is a third party credit instrument. Now that can be the official currencies or bank credit that we're used to using, or it can be private currencies issued by producers, or it can be through direct credit clearing amongst buyers and sellers, which I will explain. <clears throat> so a proper currency is a credit instrument that represents the value of goods and services that are available for sale now or in the immediate future. <clears throat> so try to keep that in mind as we go through what a proper currency has to do. Private and community currencies and credit clearing exchanges can provide producers and local economies with a reliable source of credit and supplemental payment media based on real value that is created within a community or region. Now, this is in drastic contrast to money that's created by banks by making loans at interest
Well, let's take an example of uh, how a business or municipality might issue a currency into circulation. <clears throat> it might issue the currency by paying its workers or suppliers with its currency in return for the labor, services, and supplies uh, that that group provides to them. Now, of course, the workers, they need to get value for that currency. So they look to the merchants in the local community uh, to accept that currency as well in return for the goods and services that they sell. Now that currency can circulate any number of times amongst the merchants and, and other people in the community before it goes back to the issuer to be extinguished in return for the goods and services that that business or municipal issuer promised. So this is the completion of the reciprocity circuit. <clears throat> the points to understand is that a currency has a beginning when it's issued and it has an end when it's redeemed, not for some other currency, but for goods and services that the issuer promised to provide. Now there's a proper basis of issue and an improper basis of issue. So when we talk about municipalities being issuers of a community currency, the proper basis is the anticipated revenues that they get from taxes and fees for services. Basically they would be monetizing the value of the services that they provide. Likewise, businesses, they can issue a currency based on their capacity to provide valuable goods or services to the market. But there can be associations of these entities as well, who enter into a cooperative agreement to jointly issue a currency based on a combination of these bases. Some examples, from the real world, during the Great Depression, there were uh, many different script issues, as they were called, uh, issued by different entities, businesses, municipalities, and others. And uh, this is one example that I feature in my book called Larkin Merchandise Bonds. During the Depression, there was a lack of money in circulation, so the Larkin Company, which had a number of retail outlets in the Buffalo Niagara Falls area of New York State, uh, they paid their workers in part <clears throat> with these merchandise bonds and uh, then received them back and redeemed them for merchandise. Canadian Tire Money has been around since the mid-1950s. It's a rebate currency that can be redeemed dollar for dollar with Canadian money uh, for subsequent purchases at Canadian Tire stores around the, <clears throat> around Canada and uh, others. Over the last 40 years, we've seen a lot of community currencies spring up. Uh, Let Systems, Berkshires, in the US, Toronto dollars, Salt Spring Island dollars in Canada, Bristol pounds, Brixton pounds, Lewis pounds, and many others in the UK. King Gower and Reggio Gold in Europe. But uh, these currencies for the most part have not had much impact. And the reasons for that is they typically follow an ineffective model. That is they're sold for cash, which doesn't get us any independence from conventional money. <clears throat> they have an improper or an inadequate value basis. Uh, there's insufficient involvement 
by the business community. Uh, they rely too much on volunteer management and people are suspicious of them because they're still enthralled to political money. Um, we're getting short on time and I wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna skip over these and get to direct credit clearing. Mutual credit clearing involves an association of producers who agree to come together and accept each other's credit as payment instead of being paid in cash. So the participants use their own credit directly within this network of trust. The way it starts is you have an issuing member who is allowed to have a negative balance, starts the ball rolling by drawing on his credit line to buy something from another producer. So this, this member gets a debit to his account. This one gets a credit to her account. Those credits can then circulate throughout the network, eventually coming back to the issuer who then gets a credit in return for his goods and services, which uh, then brings his account balance back to zero. Uh, this is real. This has been going on for a long time now. A primary example is the Vera Bank in Switzerland, which started out during the Great Depression when small, so, <clears throat> small and medium-sized businesses came together uh, to try to find a way to continue to do business despite the lack of Swiss francs in circulation. We've had over the last 45 years or so, a number of commercial trade exchanges spring up to do the same thing. According to the IRTA, the International Reciprocal Trade Association, um, these trade exchanges collectively do about 12 to $14 billion worth of trades a year. And uh, these trade exchanges aren't banks. They're not uh, subject to banking regulations. In the US, they're recognized by the IRS as third party record keepers. <clears throat> so the future that I see is mutual credit clearing exchanges will proliferate around the world. Standards of design and practice will emerge, which will enable local exchanges to be networked into a worldwide web of exchange that will maintain control of credit at the community level while providing a global, globally useful means of, of payment. So I'd like to share with you a seven minute uh, video that we prepared a while back. I call it VITA, a worldwide web of exchange, locally controlled, but globally useful. Introducing VITA, a universal transaction system for the 21st century. You earn credits when you sell and you spend when you buy. VITA is the 21st century solution for managing your financial transactions. Vita is like a credit card, a debit card, a checking account, all rolled into one. Employers, employees, merchants, consumers, Vita is for everyone. You own it, we own it, Vita is a mutual for benefit company. Vita is locally controlled yet globally useful. It's a way to pay and be paid. Vita is a mutual credit accounting system. 
Vita uses no national monetary unit. Accounts are kept in a stable, non-political unit of account called a bell. Vita uses no national currency for payments. Payments are made using our own credit in a process called credit clearing. Your sales pay for your purchases. Using your Vita account. With your Vita account, you can make purchases, make donations, or transfer value to anyone anywhere. It's just like writing a check or using your debit card. With your Vita account, you can receive payments for wages, salaries, sales, and other income, just like receiving direct deposits to your bank account. But with Vita, every member has an interest-free line of credit. That means that your Vita account can have a negative balance. Your spending and your earning do not need to be perfectly synchronized. You can either spend before you earn or earn before you spend. Here is a typical checking account. Your account balance must always be positive. Negative balances are not allowed. In a typical credit card account, the balance must be paid in full at the end of each month to avoid interest and penalty charges. But with your Vita account, there's an ongoing difference between your receipts and expenditures. How does it work? Personal membership. Let's say your salary is deposited on Tuesday and you go shopping on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Your account begins at zero. You deposit your salary for 1,000, bringing your balance to 1,000. You buy groceries for 120, which brings your balance down to 880. You then make a car payment of 360, which brings your balance down now to 520. You buy some furniture, spending 610 vowels, which brings your account now down to negative 90 vowels. And then you get your next salary payment for 1,000, which brings your account balance up to positive 910. With the business membership, sales are credited to your account. Purchases and wage payments are debited against your account. Here are some hypothetical business transactions. Again, your account starts at zero. Your initial transaction is you buy supplies for 800 bells. So your account goes negative by 800. Then you make sales of 14,000, which brings your account balance to a balance of positive 13,200. Then you make your payroll payments to employees for 27,000, which brings your account balance down into the negative territory at negative 13,800. You make sales of 13,300, which brings your balance up still in the negative, negative 500, with additional sales of 11,400. Your account balance now comes back into the positive territory at 10,900. The membership structure of Vita is a web of trust. Each member joins as part of an affinity group whose members vouch for one another and ensure each other's account balance. Vita is a holarchy of nested nodes. Individuals join groups. Groups exist within clusters, clusters within companies, and companies within communities, and so on, from the local up to the global. Account balances are limited at each level, so risks are limited. Defaults are rare within a web of trust. 
Defaults that do occur are borne by all the other entities at that same level, thus isolating problems and protecting the network. Problem accounts are addressed in a timely manner at the appropriate level. The harmonization of interests assures that all can be successful. Vita is a chaotic network organized as a for benefit corporation governed by all of its members through their affinity groups. Vita is a worldwide web of exchange, locally controlled, but globally useful. Vita, it's where we want to be. Okay, well, that's just my vision as it exists at the moment. None of that is uh, cast in stone. There's certainly room for discussion and uh, consideration of other possibilities. <clears throat> anyway, I'm sorry that it took so long. Uh, I'd like to now stop sharing my screen. Actually, these, uh, these resources you can consult these, they're all on my uh, website. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can uh, go to Q&A. Thank you very much, Thomas. And um, I, um, this is fascinating uh, indeed. And, and uh, I think a change is needed. So, um, and uh, we have been recording this session. So if um, uh, before people start uh, kind of um, going out of this session, if they can just uh, leave their email address if they wish to receive the recording.